Oh, and Jasha, drive slowly the camels with the glass vessels, i.e. the women. Here's one about a black slave who was shot to death while unloading Muhammad's luggage, Sunan Andasai 3858. It was narrated that Abu Huraira said, we were with the messenger of Allah in the year of Kaibar, and we did not get any spoils of war except for wealth, goods, and clothes. Then a man from Banu Ad-Dubayb, who was called Rifa bin Zaid, gave the messenger of Allah a black slave who was called Middam. The messenger of Allah set out for Wadi al qura When we were in Wadi al qura while Middam was unloading the luggage of the messenger of Allah, an arrow came and killed him. The people said, congratulations, you will go to paradise. But the messenger of Allah said, no, by the one in whose hand is my soul, the cloak that he took from the spoils of war on the day of Kaibar is burning him with fire. Just to clarify, Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, robbed caravans, and beheaded hundreds of Jews, but he's good. His black slave, by contrast, grabbed a cloak before the spoils were divided, so he's headed to hell. Welcome to Islam. In Provisions of the Afterlife, pages 30 to 31, Ibn Qayyim al Jazia lists 28 of Muhammad's male slaves and 12 of his female slaves. Some of these slaves were black, some were not. Muhammad renamed one of his black slaves Safina, which means ship. He called his slave ship because he would load up the slave like a ship and make him carry everything. Muhammad apparently thought that black slaves were worth less than Arab slaves, since he once traded two of his black slaves for an Arab slave he wanted to set free because the Arab slave had converted to Islam. We know that Muhammad had sex with his female slaves because he eventually got one of them pregnant. Don't worry, a white leader getting a slave girl pregnant is only creepy when Thomas Jefferson does it. Speaking of leaders, mindlessly obeying Muslim leaders was so important to Muhammad that when he wanted to emphasize obedience, he told his followers that they had to obey even the worst leader imaginable. We find Muhammad's worst case scenario in Sahih al-Bukhari 7142. Narrated Anas bin Malik, Allah's Messenger said, You should listen to and obey your Imam, even if he was an Ethiopian slave whose head looks like a raisin. Muhammad gives a similar example in Sahih Muslim 3138, where he commands his followers to obey their leader, even if he's a black slave with missing limbs. So the worst possible leader of a community of Muslims, according to Muhammad, would be a black slave. For the sake of clarity, I should point out that women are excluded from the hierarchy of possible leaders, Muhammad said that a nation will never be successful with a woman as a leader. But it gets worse. Muhammad tells his followers what Satan looks like in Ibn Asak, page 243. The apostle said, whoever wants to see Satan, let him look at Nabtal ibn al-Harith. He was a sturdy black man with long flowing hair and flamed eyes and dark ruddy cheeks. Which one of you is the prophet? This white guy. What does Satan look like? That black guy. Now, how did a religion that was inaugurated by a white prophet who had black slaves and referred to Ethiopians as raisin heads and said that Satan looks like a black man ever get the reputation it has among African-American Muslims today? Well, here in the West, there's a general atmosphere of ignorance about Islam. People don't know even the most basic facts about Muhammad and the Quran, and this allows Muslim preachers to say whatever they want about Islam because no one's going to correct them. So if a Muslim preacher is talking to a woman who's interested in women's rights, Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. If he's talking to someone who has a high regard for science, the Quran is a scientific masterpiece filled with miraculous scientific insights that were only verified centuries later. If he's talking to someone who's concerned about racial justice, Islam is the religion that liberates slaves and establishes racial equality. Absolute nonsense, but people convert to Islam because they believe what they're told and don't bother reading the Muslim sources to see if the preacher's story checks out. Now, to those of you who've bought this mess, to those of you who believed the Muslim preacher when he said, hey, if you really want to stick it to whitey, you need to convert to Islam, the religion of a white man who bought, sold, and traded African slaves and whose followers institutionalized black African slavery centuries before Europeans joined in and who continue enslaving black Africans even today. If you fell for this, I say and I say it again, you've been had, you've been took, you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok. This is what these white prophets with black slaves do. But now that you've seen what the Muslim sources say, now that you know you've been deceived, you have a choice. 
You can either leave Islam or you can continue serving a man whose descriptions in your most trusted sources make him completely indistinguishable from the Pillsbury Doughboy and whose teachings legitimized race-based slavery for 14 centuries. Just remember that if you continue honoring a slave trader who's about as dark as the cream filling of a Twinkie and who had black slaves and called Ethiopians raisin heads and said that Satan looks like a black man, you're not a freedom fighter or a social justice warrior or a champion of civil rights. You are the ultimate Uncle Tom. And in case you'd like to know how seriously they take Muhammad's whiteness in the Muslim world, I'll leave you with a quotation from Ashifa one of Islam's most popular and respected books on Muhammad's life and teachings. Ahmed ibn Suleiman, Sahnun's companion, said that whoever says that the prophet was black is killed. The prophet was not black. Calling Muhammad a black man was a death penalty. Muhammad was an evil white devil cracker. <laughs>